Kia ora, kia ora everybody. Um, my name is Sheila Murray. I am the Director of Development and Alumni at the University of Otago and it's um, our team that's put on this lovely um, webinar tonight and it's um, my privilege to welcome you all here and just ask you to please um, make sure that you're on mute um, throughout the presentation. If you were um, here for the first one, which Professor Tony Valentine did, we will follow exactly the same format. We will have a presentation from Gemma, um, which she will be introduced by Professor Tony Valentine tonight. And then we'll have time for some questions, which will be managed through the chat, chat function. So if you have a question, please put it into the chat in the end. Um, and then once again, as we have with the first presentation, we will um, put this up onto our YouTube and let you know uh, when it's available because we are recording tonight's function. So uh, I'd like to um, uh, welcome Professor Tony Ballantyne. He's the Deputy Vice Chancellor for External Engagement, and he is um, tonight introducing Gemma. Um, thanks, Professor Ballantyne. Tēnā uh, koe Sheila, and tēnā koutou katoa. He mihi nui ki te mana whenua o tēnē rohi, waitaha ka te māmo e kaitahu, ki nga mauna whakahi, ki nga wai tili nei, ki nga rangatira huhua. I nga rangatira, i nga humahi, so many thanks, Sheila, and it's great to see you all. And thank you for joining us for this, the second of the uh, March with Otago Lecture Series. We have a really fantastic speaker this evening, an outstanding researcher who also happens to be an Otago graduate. So it's my real pleasure to introduce Dr. McKeegan. Uh, Gemma is an evolutionary biologist and a virologist who has a really strong research focus on emerging infectious disease. Gemma's research is focused on several areas across the field of virology. These include determining the fundamental patterns and processes of viral evolution, um, ecology and emergence, and using metagenomics to relate the diversity, reveal the diversity structure and evolution of the virus sphere and examining case specific evolution of major viral infections that affect humans and animals. Now, she's also been called a modern day explorer and her background is steeped in exploration. Born just outside of Edinburgh and in Cooper, where her first love and expertise was dance, she was accepted into the Scottish Ballet and performed in London, Glasgow and Edinburgh. However, deciding that ballet was not a lifelong career, she enrolled at the University of Strathclyde and completed a Bachelor of Science with honors in genetics, specializing in forensic biology. She then went on to undertake a PhD here at the University of Otago with Professor Hamish Spencer. She then carried on with her exploration, moving to the United States where she worked at New York University with a group working on HIV, which was her first experience of working with viruses and where she found her knowledge of evolutionary biology brought a different and important perspective from most other virologists whose background was in a clinical setting. Her next stop on her journey was a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Sydney before getting her own lab at Macquarie University. In early 2020, she returned to Otago for a joint position with Otago's Department of Microbiology and Immunology and the Institute of Environmental Science and Research, and was just in time for the first case of COVID to arrive in New Zealand. So perfect timing or terrible timing, I'm not sure which one. Um, and, and it of course occurred in February, 2020. Um, from here, uh, Gemma became a household name in New Zealand as the population was introduced to the importance of being able to uh, genomic sequence COVID positive cases as part of Aotearoa's arsenal in the fight against the pandemic. In 2020, Gemma was one of 10 to be awarded a prestigious um, Rutherford Discovery Fellowship. And with this fellowship, she will continue with her research to investigate how viruses evolve, what barriers may hinder or promote virus emergence. We are so delighted that Gemma navigated a course after those lengthy and complicated travels back to us here at the University of Otago and appreciate the amazing work that she's done alongside a lot of other Otago researchers and in informing and leading New Zealand's response to the COVID pandemic. So I'll hand over to Gemma in just a few seconds, but just remember 
You can put your questions into the chat function and those will be uh, processed at the end of Gemma's talk. And remember to keep yourself on mute uh, through the presentation. So I'll now pass over to Gemma, who's going to talk to us on COVID-19 and Aotearoa, insights from genomics. Uh, many thanks, uh, Gemma. All right, everyone, thank you very much, Tony, um, for that introduction. And um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about my role in um, the COVID-19 response using genomics to better inform how we dealt with this pandemic in New Zealand. So it is likely that all viruses that infect humans have origins in animal hosts. But for the most of these viruses, we have no idea where they came from and when they made that jump into humans. So for most viruses that make this leap across a species barrier, um, they just end up being dead end spillover infections where they can't be transmitted between person to person. But sometimes viruses can get lucky and when they get lucky, they can genetically or ecologically adapt to spread between people and sometimes they can cause epidemics or even pandemics. So I have spent the past um, nearly decade studying how this process is work and what makes viruses more likely to jump to new hosts. So on the 30th of December 2019, the world was alerted to four cases of an unexplained pneumonia at Wuhan Central Hospital by this very memo that I saw on Twitter. And just using this genomic sequencing technology, the very technology that we've been using today, um, Chinese scientists were able to find a cause, the causative pathogen for these um, cases. And so just 12 days after those first cases were admitted to hospital, uh, the, the coronavirus genome of this new virus was shared publicly on Twitter by my good friend Eddie Holmes. And this very first genome allowed the first diagnostic tests to be developed, as well as the first vaccines to be designed. It also set the scene for data sharing during this pandemic, which has been vitally important. So I guess the highest stakes question in this pandemic is where did this virus come from? So having this genome of the new coronavirus enabled us to identify the closest genetic relatives. And these viruses were from bats and pangolins. However, it's important that these viruses of these species are not the actual source of the new coronavirus that was circulating in humans because there's about 30 years of evolution between the viruses in bats and pangolins and the one that causes COVID-19. The fact that we don't know about where this virus has directly come from yet isn't strange though. And coronaviruses, like many viruses, love to jump to new hosts. In fact, there's been about nine coronaviruses that we know of that have been found to infect humans, but, but seven of these um, have actually made that jump into humans over the last 20 years. And bats seem to be at the center of most, if not all of these emerging events in coronaviruses. So we know that bats are an important reservoir, a natural reservoir for coronaviruses. So my colleagues and I um, looked at where those first early cases in December, where those patients both worked and lived and their proximity to both um, the live animal markets in Wuhan and the Wuhan Institute of Virology to find if we could tell where the origin was. And we found that the patterns of virus spread strongly suggested that the wildlife markets were a likely origin, which is actually the very place where you'd expect a virus emergence event to occur. So I think it's fair to say that genomics has played a starring role in this COVID-19 pandemic with over 9 million genomes of the virus shared online now. But of course, only a tiny fraction of these have been sampled from New Zealand. So New Zealand's 2020 epidemic looked like this, where we had a mixture of imported cases during that very steep first wave, followed by a brief elimination of the virus in the community. I think we became quite smug then, followed by numerous border leaks, which led to um, community transmission. So throughout this, New Zealand has largely had a scientific based approach in its decision making around its response to COVID-19 and dealing with the pandemic. Right from the beginning, you know, testing was available, serology projects were underway, and then later we had bilateral agreements with many vaccine companies. And from the beginning, and what started out just as a research project with me and my colleagues at ESR, we were able to, um, we were ready to begin sequencing the viral genomes when that 
first case arrived in late February 2020. <clears throat> so what is genomic sequencing? Um, well, if you think that it's staring at a bunch of letters on a computer screen, you would be correct. And we made a short movie about how this all works, though, and the link is, in, is on there, and I'll, I'll put, it, put it in the chat later. And you can feel free to watch that. It is aimed at kids, but it's, it's really for everybody to enjoy. But since this is a university lecture, this is phylogenomics 101. So this is how this is how your lesson, this is about your lesson about how, what we do with those genomes once we've sequenced them. And this is a cartoon of five genomes from five different infections from cases A, B, C, D, and E. And these colored dots represent different genetic mutations in these genomes. So by first aligning these genomes, we can compare their similarities and differences and then understand where these mutations relate to each other. So using this alignment, we construct their evolutionary history by estimating a phylogenetic tree. So a phylogenetic tree is a bit like a family tree, and it shows how cases are related to each other. So in this example, A and B are genetically identical, meaning that they're genetically and likely epidemiologically linked, whereas they're distantly related to case E. So it's important to monitor the ongoing evolution of COVID-19 virus or SARS coronavirus 2. Um, but very early on, there was various groups that proposed nomenclature to, to name different lineages or variants of the virus. And it became a problem. It was quite messy, as this headline suggests. And so the WHO did st step in, naming variants of interest, variants of concern, or variants under monitoring, usually de designated a Greek letter, which I'm sure will run out of soon enough. But importantly, monitoring this evolution is important. It first provides us a timeline, so we can see that all of these cases had a common ancestor, which, which um, converged around November 2019, suggesting it's unlikely that the virus was around before that time. It also suggests that this B lineage here, um, you can see in orange, is the most dominant lineage um, around. And in fact, all variants of concern have come out of that lineage. And in fact, new research suggests that lineage A, that red one at the top, and B were actually two separate host jumps from, from species, um, likely at that Wuhan um, market and, and the live animal market. So let's go back to that first wave in early 2020, when we had one of the steepest epidemic curves observed worldwide. So we began collecting samples from testing labs, sequencing the genomes of positive cases. And at that time, you know, the biggest struggle was actually getting positive cases to sequence because this was our research project and it was never part of the national response at this time. Having said that, we got really good temporal and spatial distribution of, of cases to sequence. Um, most DHBs um, contributed positive cases for us to sample and sequence. Um, so we got a really good spread over the country. So this is a phylogenetic tree where all the color dots are represented cases from New Zealand and all the gray dots are cases from overseas. And the timeline you can see at the bottom there represents that first wave in 2020. So all the different colors represent different genomic variants that were circulating at that time. And this map shows where these genetic variants ended up, which was pretty much everywhere. In fact, New Zealand saw just about every genetic variant that was circulating around during that time in that first wave. And from these data, we can estimate that there was about 300 separate introductions of the virus into the community over that time frame. But interestingly, though, we found that even though there were so many introductions, only about 20% of these introductions actually led on to further transmission. And this is probably because we had one of the strictest lo lockdowns really early on in the pandemic. But most of these introductions that led on to further transmission were actually originated from places in North America, which is quite surprising given that the virus emerged in Asia as well as, you know, um, Australia being our closest geographical neighbor, but it probably suggests that the virus was much more prevalent in North America than it previously recognized. So another thing that we can estimate using genomics is a really important parameter in infectious disease called the reproductive number or R0. And it's basically a number of 
of infection rate or, or rate of transmission. So if R0 is bigger than one, the infection will always spread. And this is Kate Winslet in an excellent movie, Contagion, explaining this. And R0 varies depending on the type of infection and also the environment. So R0 can vary, um, for example, in seasonal flu on average, um, it's about just over one, meaning just over one people on average gets infected by an infected person. But for measles, this can be as high as 18, meaning one infected person on average infects about 18 other people. So using genomics, though, we can estimate the R0 for individual clusters. So during that first wave, our biggest cluster was the Bluff Wedding Cluster, if you remember Ashley Bloomfield talking about that. And so we, we remember at the very start, this was a super spreading event that happened just before lockdown. And R0, we estimated to be around seven. And then by the second week of lockdown, this fell to nearly zero. So we can estimate um, R0 at different time frames at different in different clusters. And, and this points to the fact that lockdown was really effective at stopping transmission. So because we haven't, until you know August last year, um, when we had Delta, we hadn't had to deal with huge amounts of community transmission in New Zealand. Um, that means that we've been able to conduct really detailed genomic investigations that about really sort of rare events that would re really be overlooked if it happened elsewhere. So for example, you might remember this headline um, where a man had tested positive for COVID-19 after spending 14 days in MIQ with two negative tests. But later in the, in the community, a week later, he tested positive. So we'll call this man G. And then on the same day, his household contacts, H and I, also tested positive. But using genomics, we were able to link this person back to a nine person chain of transmission that went all the way back to India. So what happened was A, B and C got on a flight from um, India to Christchurch and um, were moved to a hotel in, in, in Christchurch for an MIQ facility. Now, A and B um, and C were all on the same flight that was about 30 percent occupancy. So this flight was um, relatively empty and they were all physically distanced, but they just happened to be within a few rows of each other. And A and B tested positive on day one and were moved to the isolation section of the hotel. Um, KC didn't test positive until day 12. And this late test um, really points to um, evidence suggesting that it was likely in-flight transmission, given that it was just, C was just in a few within a few rows of cases A and B. So then they were moved to the isolation section of the hotel as well. So case C just happened to be an adjacent room to D and E before they were moved to the isolation section. And, and there was no physical contact between the case C and case D and E. The only, um, the only surface that they might have both touched was a bin lid outside of the hotel in the hotel corridor because they had to empty their own rubbish. And if you remember back then, um, there was immediate blame for this bin lid and the Ministry of Health turned all the bin lids into foot pedals. However, we looked at um, the CCTV footage of when they were in MIQ together, and we found that there was, a four, there was over 20 hours between um, C touching the bin lid and D and E touching the bin lid. So we thought that was improbable. But what we found was on day 12, when C was when they were when they were tested on day 12, um, what happened was, you know, the nurse knocked on KC's door, they stepped out of the room into the unventilated corridor, they were swabbed by the nurse and then stepped back into the room and the door was closed. Then there was a 50 second window between closing that door to KC's room and opening the door to case D and E's room. And and then they were swabbed as well. And so there was never any um, physical contact or they were never in the same place at the same time. But yet we think this window of opportunity provided aerosol transmission um, as a route of transmission in this case. So we had an engineer look at these rooms and there was no connecting vents or plumbing. But what they found was um, a net positive air pressure inside the rooms, meaning when you open a door to an unvented corridor, the air flows out, meaning it you know, um, exacerbates the sort of aerosol particles that carry virus virus in them, and and um, you know, 
and helps aerosol transmission happen. So the aerosol transmission is really hard to prove. And this was one of the first evidence worldwide that helped prove that COVID-19 was airborne. So D&E became infected on day 12, but obviously tested negative. So they left MIQ on day, on day 14, and they just happened to get a flight back up to Auckland, and they were just happened to be seated directly behind case G. So case um, G became infected on that flight. It was just an hour long flight. And both of these travel groups went on to infect their household contacts. So this wouldn't be possible without genomics. Um, genomics were able to tell us how these cases were linked. And by studying the mutations between each case, we were able to understand who infected who and the likely timeline and direction of transmission. <clears throat> So another example is when we found a very peculiar genomic situation in MIQ, which related to this headline here, COVID-19 genomics transmission in Auckland's Jet Park MIQ hotel. So what happened was two separate, two separate groups traveled to New Zealand on different flights on different days from different countries. So case A was in one room and the other travel group shared an adjoining room, adjoining rooms right across the corridor. And importantly, this corridor was over two meters wide, thought to be far too, um, far too much of a distance for a droplet transmission to occur. In cases A and E were positive on their day one of arrival. Um, the rest of the, the cases, um, E's travel group slowly, gradually tested positive during their stay. And the only case not to test positive was case F of this travel group. And interestingly, they were the only person that had to receive the vaccine at that time. So none of this sounds unusual at this point. But when we sequenced the virus genomes, we found that the rest of cases E's travel group were not actually infected by case E, but instead they were infected by case A, who was across the corridor. And these tests were repeated and repeated again and performed by different laboratories because we wanted to rule out contamination or accidental sample swapping. So again, we studied the CCTV of the time that they were in MIQ, and we found there was three simultaneous door openings of about three to four seconds long, usually when food was delivered to the rooms. And again, we think this provides really good evidence that aerosol that, that the aerosol transmission happens and COVID-19 is airborne. And this might not sound surprising, but actually it's been a really hot topic during this pandemic of the likely, um, likely the best route of COVID-19 transmission and the most prominent route is airborne transmission. So all of our border incursions have been informed by genomics, um, linking cases to, to the border or identifying cluster memberships of cases in the community. And this has all helped to eliminate COVID-19 in the community. So all of these mini trees that you can see on this figure represent border leaks that we've had before Delta, um, identifying which, which border case that they, they, um, they were leaked from. So, Genomics had really been used in a unique way in New Zealand, always at the front of informing how cases are linked and linked to the border. But Delta didn't only just change New Zealand's strategy for dealing with COVID-19, um, changing from elimination to a suppression strategy, but it also changed the role of genomics in this pandemic here too. So now, you know, my colleagues at ESR, we continue to sequence the a proportion of genomes to monitor the virus's spread and evolution. But of course, you know, the sheer number of positive cases, as well as the number of at-home tests that people are doing, mean that um, there are fewer and fewer actual samples to sequence. However, we're continuing to sequence, um, especially those cases that end up in hospital and, and others that are deemed sort of high risk. So today we're dealing with several outbreaks in the community, which are dominated mainly by two um, lineages of Omicron, and these are called BA1 and BA2. And you might have heard about these lineages in the news recently. So you've probably heard that BA2 is even more contagious compared to BA1. Now these two sister lineages are both classes Omicron, and they both emerged in uh, southern parts of Africa around about the same time. And BA1 was the first to take off worldwide, but it's been replaced by BA2 not entirely, but BA2 seems to be increase, increasing in frequency and frequently and also dominating in many countries now. 
And it's the case in New Zealand where BA2 now represents um, nearly 80% of the genomes that are being sequenced and sampled. So in fact, with BA2, it sneaked into New Zealand several times, and a few of these incursions have really taken off, spreading, uh, spreading countrywide, ca causing widespread outbreaks. So you can see um, in this phylogenetic tree, all these blue lines represent um, BA2 outbreaks. These things were associated with things like the sound splash event, so quite super spreading events, as you would expect. But it seems to be increasing in, frequent, in frequency, and it does have a slight growth advantage over BA1, so it's even more contagious, meaning it's about 30% um, more contagious compared to BA1. So it's really important, even though we're not informing the elimination strategy and sequencing every single positive case in New Zealand, it's important that ongoing genomic surveillance is, um, is part of our infectious disease program going forward. And this isn't just to monitor the evolution and emergence of new novel variants, which will come, um, but it's also for detecting things like reverse zoonosis events. Um, this is where viruses spill back to from humans to animals can potentially then um, go, undergo lots of mutation and adaptation in the animal reservoir and then re-emerge re into humans. And this is a potential hypothesis for the emergence of, of especially Omicron because it's so divergent compared to the other variants that we've had before it. And finally, um, I'd just like to highlight some of the work that me and my team have done um, where we've um, implemented this data into public facing interactive narratives using um, using Nextrain, which um, luckily um, a, a friend in New Zealand um, built as part of his PhD. And so Nextrain um, has been a tool used worldwide and we've been able to do a New Zealand specific version where we're able to um, have display our data and our interpretation of it, as well as you can download this data and play around with it. You can make your own phylogenetic trees and, and, and study the spread of the virus um, through time and space. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you. So Tony, are you going to uh... Thank Gemma. I, I can. Thank you so much, Gemma. It's fantastic to have uh, both, if you like, the biological foundations of what we're dealing with explained so clearly, but also the, the contribution of the, the kind of science you're at the frontiers of to our, our response. And um, as I said before, as an institution, we're incredibly proud of the contribution our researchers have made to our national response. Our response, to, as you observed, has been really firmly anchored in the science and we're really pleased that you've taken the time out this evening to share your expertise with us and I can see that there are quite a few questions and hands up and questions will come through the chat so uh, thank you again and I'll pass over to Sheila who will moderate the Q&A. Thank you very much Tony. Thanks Tony. Um, so the first question is um, given only a few coronaviruses have leaked what are the chances of two in close succession? Yeah, so um, as I said in my talk, there have been nine coronaviruses which have leaked um, and seven in the last 20 years. So it does seem that, um, that the frequency of virus host jumping generally, not just for coronaviruses, is increasing because we're, you know, ever encroaching on, on wildlife's habitat. So um, generally, it's not particularly just coronaviruses, but the, the frequency of virus host jumps into humans is increasing. Um, who knows if it's going to be a, the next one is going to be a coronavirus or not. So how do you think the pandemic would have played out if we were not able to do not genomic sequence, Gemma? Um, yeah, so our, our knowledge of this, um, of the evolution of this virus um, has all come from genomic sequencing. The, the knowledge that we've gained from, um, from the emergence of new variants to um, the development of mRNA vaccines, that's all come from genomic sequencing. And so we would never have um, had had vaccines this quickly or, or the mRNA vaccines that have proven so effective against combating the virus and um, without the genome. So 
genomics has played a, a huge role, um, not just for, you know, in New Zealand where we've used it to inform elimination, but, but most countries have been contributing at least some genomes um, to monitor the situation in, in different areas of the world. So um, it will continue to, to be a huge role. And as I said, 9 million genomes, it's sort of unprecedented. Mm. So can you tell us anything about the headlines we've seen about a hybrid between Delta and Omicron? Yeah, so we know that um, recombination is a really important part of adaptation, um, generating new variation in, in virus genomes. Um, and it, it's a really important part in, in coronaviruses in particular, um, but it happens in all viruses. Either they recombine or reassort depending on their type of genomes they have. And it's not surprising that we're seeing the um, more um, reports of, of recombination. It's sort of hard to detect because um, you're detecting basically somebody's had a mixed infection of, of two variants at the same time. And then the chances of actually sampling and sequencing that um, that infection and then detecting that, that hybrid. So it's called a recombination event. And it's not that surprising that now it, Delta and Omicron were just so prevalent in the communities worldwide that um, the chances of finding those uh, those events are actually occurring now. Mm. So um, this question is, so the prob probability of further muta mutations is quite high, question mark. Is there any future time where it could be possible that COVID-19 inverted commas runs out? Or do you see it mutating and jumping between humans and animals and back forever? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, you know, it, it's it's likely that it's now endemic in humans. Um, endemic doesn't necessarily mean forever, but um, but for the foreseeable future, um, there's no way of eliminating it from um, from the human population. And um, and that's mainly because of the inequitable distribution of vaccines and, and so on, which always allows the virus to, to hang around in, in various populations. And the various, um, the very populations where we've been able to detect new variants um, tend to be populations with much lower vaccination rates. And so, um, you know, these populations um, are sort of, reservoirs of, of um, new virus variants because of the high transmission. There's also, you know, possibilities of um, reverse zoonoses events, like I talked about, um, that, to create new variants as well, um, as well as populations of immune suppressed people. For example, you know, South Africa is also grippling with a uh, um, huge HIV uh, epidemic and and so um, you know lots of patients that would become infected with COVID-19 would have this sort of suppressed immune system allowing um, chronic long-term infections providing sort of a training ground for you know adaptation to to humans which means um, new variants are always going to come along um, so I can't see this ever running out. <laughs> mm. So is there any Delta circulating in New Zealand at present? The graph um, that you had showed the two Omicron variants during the last few weeks, is there Delta? So um, about two weeks ago, we last sampled Delta in the community. It was only a fraction of genomes compared to the huge amount of Omicron genomes. However, at the moment, you know, because the vast majority of people are doing a rapid antigen test, usually at home, meaning that there's no sample to, to send, you know, to ESR for sequencing. So basically, the, the only... Um, the, really the only um, samples that we're getting to sequence are ones who end up in hospital, which is really important to do. In fact, that's kind of the most important to do to understand if there's any differences in severity in, in the variants um, that, we're, that we're experiencing here. Um, and, and so that's only a really tiny fraction. Um, so we're sequencing under 500 genomes a week at the moment, which is um, a very small proportion of actual reported cases and a tiny proportion of actual infections, um, given that reported cases are probably about a third of, of actual infections. So um, for the past two weeks, we haven't actually sequenced any Delta, but it doesn't mean it, it's there. Um, it, it's likely remaining at low levels. I mean, 
even the most stringent lockdown level four didn't um, eliminate Delta from the community. So, and there's still lots of susceptible hosts. So I'd be surprised if Delta has completely burnt itself out. Okay. You, um, you showed us some images from social media in your presentation, Gemma. Has social media changed how science has worked in the global response to the pandemic? Has it helped scientific collaboration? It is definitely changed. Um, you know, people are tweeting results before even a preprint, um, which is a sort of pre-publication, um, pre-peer-reviewed publication comes out. So um, definitely science, um, the way that people share data and share results um, has changed. It's not always for the good um, because, you know, the scientific um, peer review process is, is Come still extremely valid and important, but it, it's really um, sort of allowed um, you know data to be accessible, as well as people to kind of keep on top of the huge amounts of of scientific literature that's coming out daily. Um, there are always sort of summaries, um, sort of threads posted online, which really helps digest the sort of various results coming out. Mm. Okay, is there, um, is there any other questions that anyone has tonight? Um, we've run through the ones that have been put up in the chat. Um, is there anything else people would like to ask? If not, um, we can bring tonight, oh, got one coming here. Um, in your opinion, do you think the general public have a better understanding of science now? Oh, definitely. I mean, science has really been at the forefront um, of this response, especially in New Zealand. You know, um, you know, the prime minister is talking about mutations and genomic variants and so on. So it's you know, genomic sequencing, particularly, I think, has been in you know used in everyday language now, um, whereas before I don't think most people kind of was, were even aware of it. So I think that um, it, it's definitely helped to promote science and and I hopefully that's sort of translated to the sort of next generation who want to come and study it too. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole lot of new terminology out there that's become very common in every day now. So Okay, all right. Well, um, we don't seem to have any other questions. Um, we've had a great response to uh, tonight. So um, I'd like to thank you once again, Gemma. I know Tony has formally thanked you, but thank you. Um, and thank you for everybody who's come along and listened tonight. Um, as we said at the beginning, we are recording the session. So um, we will um, get this out to you as soon as we can. Uh, just one last question that's just popped in very quickly. Um, is anyone looking at human genome information, Ari, who's susceptible or who's not? Yeah, of course, there's a, quite a lot of research into that, um, especially when it comes to sort of long term effects um, and who is susceptible to more severe disease and long COVID and so on. And there, there does seem to be some, rep um, some reported um, results suggesting that there is a hereditary um, element of it. Um, it's not clear um, if it's sort of a genomic or epigenomic or um, what sort of uh, genes might be involved in that, but um, there's some, some evidence clearly that suggests that um, it could be hereditary. We don't know too much about that yet though. Okay, all right, so we've got another quick question. Uh, we've got time, so there's no rush, but um, we, we have got time. Do you have a focus on how an animal to human transmission can be reduced or prevented? Yeah, I mean, we can first of all start by not having live animal markets. I think that would be a <laughs> really a good, good start. A really good start. Um, I think the wildlife trade, um, you know, particularly the sort of illegal wildlife trade that occurs, um, uh, is you know um is a good place to start and and farming practices um but having said that we need better surveillance as well so we can do a lot more to to survey this sort of um human animal interface so um sampling both people and animals at this interface um the people that work with animals farmers um and people that you know um work in slaughterhouses, for example, there's lots of places that you can 
you could just survey just to make sure that these host jumps are not um, occurring, but if they do, you catch them immediately. Mm, great, okay. All right, we might wrap it up here. Um, what we can do is we, if you have got questions uh, that you think of, absolutely. Oh, people are now flying in with questions. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, there's a, oh, I don't know, I'll ask that question. Um, has fine, I can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll do the one that's not um, tough. Has SQL shown which variant is more likely to give long COVID? Uh, no, um, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, we don't even know if Omicron is likely to give you long COVID yet because it's not been around long enough. So um, we know that vaccines um, largely reduce the chances of, of getting long COVID. Um, and there hasn't been enough investment in long COVID research yet. Um, clearly, it is in its sympathy. So we don't know too much about which variants are more likely to do that. Um, in fact, even um, really mild cases of COVID-19 can cause long-term problems. So it's not really about the severity of the, of the illness at the time um, that, that dictates whether or not you get long COVID. Mm. Okay, do you want to ask that last question, Gemma? Have we? Yeah, so um, have we completely excluded the Wuhan Institute of Virology as a possible source of, or accidental release, or is it too controversial? Well. Um, so, you know, the scientific process looks at the evidence and there's not a single bit of evidence that suggests that it has come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, whereas there is a lot of evidence to suggest that it's come from live animal markets. Um, in particular, um, just about two weeks ago, there was a couple of papers, that a um, couple of preprints that um, have made um, a huge amount of headlines worldwide because, um, researchers looked at you know environmental swabs of those animal markets and the proximity to where cages that contained mammals were and um and you know it's really clear that both lineages a and b were present at that market so the chances of both lineages coming to the market from the wuhan institute of virology is very rare as well as um it's a proximity to we where we know for a fact that it was cages containing live mammals like ferret badgers and um and things like that so i think there's lots of evidence supporting um supporting that as an origin as well you know live animal markets were um there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they were uh, important in the emergence of sars cov one mm -hmm. the first time uh, in 2003 so mm -hmm. um yeah so and, it, and it's not surprising, right, that that, that would be the very, the very place where a new virus would emerge. Mm, okay. So last question, last question. And if there's any more, then please, um, we will follow up with you um, and answer that last question. So there's no indication of GE in the original genome, i.e. exact base insert or splice sites. Now that's very technical. <laughs> so I, I'm guessing they mean genetic engineering. Um, and and by splice sites, I guess you mean where the, um, where the virus binds to our cells. And um, there is a, uh, a site called a furin cleavage site. Um, and that very site um, contains about five amino acids that helps the, the virus bind to our cells. And when it first emerged, um, the virus first emerged, it was actually um, ill-adapted to humans. And the very same sequence of that furin cleavage site was found in loads of other coronaviruses within the coronaviridae family. Um, for example, feline coronaviruses have the exact same um, through in cleavage site and and lots of others do as well um so it's nothing special about the virus that causes COVID-19 and now it's it's um that cleavage site is actually a much better adapted to humans so if you're engineering a virus to cause a pandemic in humans why would you make it ill adapted to humans um so none of that really makes sense okay all right uh, Rebecca's come through who asked the question with an explanation of what a splice site is. But um, so um, how long will it take for an Omicron specific vaccine is available in your in your in your thinking? Well, I know that um, with Pfizer um, and Moderna sort of announced uh, as soon as sort of Omicron emerged that they were making an Omicron specific vaccine. 
I'm not sure if that's the best idea. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a vaccinologist, but um, you know, as we've seen over this um, last two years, you know, new variant has emerged and dominated every about six months. Um, and so by the time um, something's manufactured and widely distributed, um, we'll be on to the next variant, I suppose. So um, I'm not sure if that's exactly um, the best the best case scenario. I think that perhaps working on vaccines that, um, that can be give protection against um, a wide range of variants could, mm. could potentially um, be really good. But they both said within 100 days they could start manufacturing it. So who knows if we'll get in here. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you once again, Gemma. I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and thank you once again for the great explanations. Um, thank you everybody for coming along. Uh, we the final in our March with the Targo uh, presentations is on the 30th, so in a fortnight. We look forward to seeing you all then. And as I said, we will be sending out the recording um, with the on a YouTube with a link to that um, in the next few days. Thank you very much and have a great night. Thanks everybody.